Well, today we're going to be sharing with you a message that has kind of a catchy title, but it's not really about the title at all. But it's a hot mess at a Samaritan well. It's from John chapter 4. Now, my usual habit is to share the text or share the scriptures and then go back and use a key word like ideas or discoveries or examples or applications or whatever. But there's so much in this portion of Scripture from verse number 1 all the way down to verse 42 that I decided to break it up into uh, sections, five sections. So we're going to see those Scriptures, not read them out loud, but we'll see them. And then I'll talk a little bit about each one, but then at the end we'll have five takeaways. Uh, And so those notes are in the bulletin along with some of the notes that I would be sharing. So let's start today with section number 1, which is verses one through nine, and that is Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Now, we'll talk in a moment about what it meant to be a Samaritan in the time of Jesus, but we're just going to read the Scriptures and set the stage. So here we go. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John which, as we'll read, is not true, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. But he had, in order to do that, he had to go through Samaria. So I've given you a map. And the map shows you that the bottom part where Jerusalem is circled, that's Judea, and the northern part is Samaria. I mean, the middle part is Samaria, and north of that is Nazareth. So he had to go through that in, in order to get there. It's a little, about, a little bit like saying, I want to go to Mansfield, but I have to go through Crawford County to get there. It's kind of like that. And so as he goes through there, that takes us a three-day journey, and he stops at the well, and here's what it says next. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Would you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food, so they weren't there. Then the Samaritan woman said this to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then in parentheses, the Bible says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, some of you know everything I'm going to say here in just a moment. You've you've read this. You understand it. But the Samaritans were viewed by Jews as unclean. They weren't just two different sects of, of Jewry. They were hated. They hated each other. If you were a Samaritan man and you had a business, you would never expect a Jew to walk in and buy a chainsaw from you. He's not going to do it. If you went to Walmart and there was a Samaritan there, you would, you would do everything you could to not have to look at him or speak, at him, speak to him because you viewed them as unclean. And part of the reason of that has to do with the end of the Babylonian captivity around 587 B.C., and as the, as the Jews came back in three different groups, the last group were, were a large group of Jews who had intermarried with the Babylonians, and they came back. So they were not pure Jews in the eyes of the Jews. The word half-breed is an offensive term, and I know it is, but that's how they often looked at it. Now, the interesting thing about Jesus' ministry is that in Luke chapter 10, he tells a story about the good Samaritan. And some of you are smiling because you can see where I'm going with that. The Jews, when he told that story, must have chuckled in themselves or looked at each other and smirked and said, there is no such thing as a good Samaritan. And they really believe that. And so he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, which I'm not going to tell at length, except there's a man laying along the side of the road, been beat up and left for dying, uh, and he's a Jew. Along comes a Levite and a priest, both Jews, and they 
walk away and look at him kind of in like this. And along, along comes a Samaritan. What does he do? He stops and helps him and ministers to him, puts him in a hotel for two or three days, tells the shopkeeper, I'll pay you more if you need more. And the people that were listening to that story were amazed. A good Samaritan. So that gives us context of the relationship of Jesus to the woman. Let's look at our second section today, which is verses 10 through 15 where we find that Jesus is our life-giving water. Now, the dialogue between Jesus and the woman regarding water, it becomes evident as we read in the next section that she really didn't get it. That's okay. What Jesus says is what matters. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have, you would have asked Him, and He would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. How can you get to this living water? Like somehow it's below the regular water. And that's a reasonable conclusion. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from him himself, as did his sons and livestock? And Jesus said, Everyone who drinks from this well water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And she said, sir, she says it innocently. It just reveals her lack of understanding. Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. In John chapter number 7, I'm not going to ask you to have to turn there, but I'm going to read it to you with the emphasis that I think is intended. In John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, this is at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. The Jews had, I think, seven major feasts, and we would recognize Passover, Easter. We would recognize the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, things like that. And... On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, where the Jews would recognize, being, they would honor and remember being out in the desert for 40 years, they would move away from their homes and out into the country, and with branches and leaves, they would build little thatch-type houses, and they would live them for seven days. They would just live there. And then they would come back into Jerusalem and celebrate the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so this is what it says. On the last and greatest day of the Feast, Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has, has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And again, he's not talking about the water from the well, is he? He's very clear. What a shock this would have been. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And up till that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. Let's look at our third section today, and that's verse 16 through 18, Jesus and our moral life. So Jesus tells her, go get your husband, bring him back. She said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. She acknowledges that. She's busted. And this is where the, this is where the hot mess at the Samaritan well really starts to unfold. You're right. I'm busted. You got me. What you have said is quite true. My administrative assistant for 12 years at Union Chapel, Jamie Horn, had three little children, and there were days when she'd come in, and I'd say, you okay, and she didn't look quite right. And later she'd come in and sit down in front of me, and she'd sometimes have tears, sometimes not, and she'd say, I'm just a hot mess today. And I've heard that from a lot of ladies, more than men, 
But the ladies who say, I got soccer practice tonight, and I've got four kids going to three different games, and there's only going to miss, you know, the groceries, you name it. Let me give a definition of a hot mess. It's used to describe a situation or person that is chaotic, disorganized, or in a state of complete disorder out of control. And it's often used to describe a situation that is so messy, so disorganized, that it becomes comical. And that's what Jamie meant. I'm a hot mess today. And so I would pray with her and sometimes put my arms around her and just say, you're going to be okay. Here, let me go get you a pop or what can I do that would give her a piece of candy, whatever it was, and just try to help her. So that's what we think about with this idea. The, the woman at the well, when Jesus says, go get your husband and bring him back so we can be part of that, well, um, all of a sudden she was a hot mess. It was, it was out of control. Now, Section number four, verses, whoops, I think maybe I missed something. Let me go back. Nope, 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 didn't. Okay, section number four is verses 27 through 30, and that's where this Jesus life water creates spiritual vitality. Again, what we're doing is we're giving just an overview of a kind of a catchphrase and then reading the Scripture so we can see the Word of God together. Just then... His disciples were returned and were surprised that he was talking to a woman. Did they know that the girl was a Samaritan? I'd say probably, since they were in Samaria. But it's interesting that the Bible says, but none of the disciples ask, what do you want? Or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town, said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. That's a little bit of a stretch, isn't it? He told her one thing. He didn't really review her whole life, but that's how it felt to her. So they came out of the town and they made their way towards him. Let's look at section 5, the final one from verses 39 through 42, and that is Jesus and believing. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I'd ever done. A little bit of a stretch, but you get the idea. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. He stayed two days. And because of his words, many of the Samaritans became believers. Then they turned to the woman and said, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. I'm trying not to sneeze, but I'm not going to make it. Don't think. So let's talk about this word believe for a moment. I've mentioned this when I've preached a couple of times, but I just want to review it quickly. In our culture today, if you ask somebody what they believe, and it doesn't have to be about religion, I mean, it can be about anything. Many people will respond with this phrase, I feel this way or that. That's okay. But that's not what it means to believe. When you feel a certain way about a certain thing, all it means is you haven't thought about it enough to really believe. Now, Diane and I got married almost 51 years ago. Soon will be 51 years. I got a wedding ring on my my finger, and somewhere we've got a a wedding uh, license, I mean, yeah, wedding certificate license that proved on August 11th of 1973 that we did, in fact, stand in a church real similar to this, only a little bit bigger, with no air conditioning and sweat like pigs and got married and lived pretty much happily ever after. Now, that's my version. Dinah might give you a different version. That's all I can say. But for somebody to say, Well, I feel that marriage is a pretty good thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good thing. And a lot of people do get married. But to believe means to make a commitment and to do that. I've also mentioned in the past that people who love America and love staying in America, love being part of the democratic system and vote, they believe. Now, I say this with kindness, but it illustrates it perfectly. If you ask somebody, you believe in, you believe in America, do you, do, you, do you vote every time you can? Do you, do you read to stay abreast of what's going on? 
and they say, well, no, actually, I don't vote. And I would respond, now, I'm not talking about people who can't get there or they're in a nursing home or something like that, but I would look at that person and lovingly say, you don't really believe. You feel, but you don't really believe because believe requires commitment. And whether it's uh, being married or voting or more importantly, as we look here, it says that many of the Samaritans believed and at least in part because of what the woman told them, and then they come out and hear the words of Jesus, and then they turn to her and say, we want you to know that we believe we are committing to the words of Jesus and who He is, not just because of what you said, but because of what we have heard. I read a book a number of years ago, and I used it in a Wednesday night service uh, for a number of months, and I may use it here Uh, starting in the fall, but it's a book simply entitled Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman. Eidelman. And the book is, uh, he's a wonderful pastor, and the book is about not being a fan of Jesus. And that sounds weird, doesn't it? But the more you read the book, the more you begin to understand what he's saying, the difference between feeling and believing. And so each chapter is is a worthy read and one that you can do on a Wednesday night very easily. But to me, the idea that uh, in our culture today, and there's no reason to be super negative about it, but it's just the reality that sometimes on Facebook, as just an example, and by the way, I'm on Facebook for just the purpose of listening to my friend's sermons. So if I don't friend you, that doesn't mean I don't like you. I just don't like to take the time to do Facebook. And other people, uh, it's a very good thing, and, and so there's no negative about it. But a lot of people you hear, and you hear and see a lot of it on Facebook and other social media, when they talk about God, when they talk about Jesus, when they talk about the church, then many times you could honestly say, it sounds to me like they're fans of Jesus, and that's all they really are but they're not committed Christ followers because their verbiage tells you that. So today is not a day where you get down on all those things except to point out the line and the difference and the demarcation, the important, the important difference between just being a fan of Jesus and being committed to Him and believing. Now that is the text. So then the question becomes, what should we take away today And here's five takeaways real quick. Number one, see the Samaritans in our culture. See the Samaritans that are all around us. Many of you are aware that over the last months, we have grown to a Haitian population of about 5,000 in the Lima area, Allen County. 5,000 people. Now, if you know anything about Haiti, any place in the world is better than being in Haiti. It is one of the most dangerous, murderous, horrible places to be. And I certainly understand why they would want to be someplace else other than that. But at this point, we have 5,000 Haitians in our region. And maybe you've read on social media or read in the newspaper or someplace, but that's created a rather large problem because they don't speak English. Many of them are driving without a driver's license. And when they get stopped by the police, they... They don't understand what they're being stopped for. And it's no secret they're, they're using a lot of resources from the county. And my first, my first reaction to that, was, I mean, months ago, was, and even asked one of my friends, and I said, does that mean that they're all in some kind of public support? And he said, well, yeah, of course, that's just the way it works. I had negative feelings about that until this week when I started this message. And I, I thought about, who are the Samaritans around me? Well, the Haitians are Samaritans. And by that, I do not mean half-breeds. I do not mean unclean. None of that stuff. Only that it's so easy for us to sit back and say, "I, I just wish that situation wasn't the way it was. Now multiply that times 10 or 11 or 12 million people that are in our country illegally and the resources they're requiring and all those things. And all of us could have some major, major different feelings about that. And all I'm saying is 
that when I see that a person is murdered, that somebody's raped, I see a child that has been molested and find out that they are a person who's in the country illegally, that's a Samaritan to me. And I have a hard time having my heart right about that. But as I, as I look at the message and what Jesus did, he didn't tell the Samaritan woman, go find me a Jewish woman or a man who can draw the water for me. He shared with her the gospel. Jesus did. So you and I are called, I believe, one of the takeaways of this great scripture we read today is to see the Samaritans in our culture. Now this might not be right, but I believe that the reason that the woman at the well was there at noon was because the women, the married women, uh, those who would be family girls, they would come to the well in the morning and the evening when it was cooler. And so she came at noon when it was the hottest, probably because of her reputation. Now, we don't want to build a doctrine around that, but it seems reasonable that she was not only a Samaritan to the Jews, but sometimes to her own people in that way. All right, let's look at our second takeaway today, and that is to draw from the right well. You might not know it, but today is Pentecost Sunday. Today is 50 days since Easter, Penta, five, Pentagon, Pentecost. This that Jesus is talking about today, this well, this fountain he's talking about that pours into us and out of us, he's really talking about the Holy Spirit and not water, not water. He's talking about the Spirit of God. And, I would, and it's not just a theological idea, but he's talking about it as life from, from life itself. And he's the well, and the Holy Spirit comes out of that well. And when he says to the woman, she doesn't get it, but it's okay. He says, I will give you water that will flow into you life and out of you like life. It will be inside of you. And her response is innocent, but hey, hey. How are you going to get to that deep, deeper water? You don't even have a bucket. And more importantly, I, I give me that water so I don't have to come draw water anymore. But he's really talking about the Holy Spirit. I would suggest today that there are so many wells all around us. And those wells offer to satisfy our thirst, don't they? But we find all too often that they simply can't. Another takeaway is to view our morality in a biblical way. We might be tempted to think that when I use or someone uses the word morality, first thing that comes to your mind is sexual purity or sexual immorality or a, a, in a physical or sexual sense, and that is certainly part of it. But let me just give you a couple of examples, two or three quick um, When you go to sell your car to a private owner um, and there's something wrong with it, do you tell them there's something wrong with it? That's morality. Anytime I trade a car in at a dealership and there's something... Now, I don't say the tires need replaced because that's obvious and they'll see that. But what I'm talking about is the times where it doesn't shift right and maybe that didn't show up on their test drive as they do an appraisal of my used car. Or the lights work sometimes but they don't work all the time. Or it makes crazy noises, but it's not making today. I believe morally I am responsible to tell that person I'm transacting a a business arrangement with to tell them what I do. John, does that sound reasonable to you as a car salesman? Why, sure. Never happens, right? Now, I will say this. I've had cars that I wouldn't sell to private individuals, but I traded it in because I didn't want them to have any problems. But I traded it at the dealership, but I told them what the problems were. That defined what my car was worth, and I knew that. But morality, is, a big part of that, is, is simply telling the truth, being a person of integrity, cheating on our taxes. Now, I don't know how I would do that exactly, because I pay a, a person $240 a year to, to take care of it for me. I'm afraid I would, I probably, if I did it myself, I would not lose any more than $240. But anyway, that's how we do it. Do we pay our taxes the way we're supposed to? 
Are we honest with each other? That's morality. Another quick story before we move on. I know a man, a businessman, and another businessman, and the first one was able to put the second one into his own business, and he gave him $25,000, $30,000 right up front. And he said, I'll help you get set up, and then you'll pay me back a little bit at a time at a very low interest rate. And that started out really well until the man that he gave the money to lied to him, lied to him about a number of things, important things. And so the man that loaned the money had to have a come to Jesus moment with him. And instead of saying this is just a business thing, the man who loaned the money and the man who did the lying both came to an agreement that this is a spiritual thing. This is an important thing. This is a moral thing. And though we might not like to say it, the man who lies to the person who's trying to help him succeeds is in one way like the man who sleeps with another man's wife. And you might say, well, those aren't equal. No, they're not, but they're both immoral. And that's the point. Now, to say it positive, it is so liberating to not be a hot mess. It's so wonderful to not be a hot mess and to live a moral life and all the good that comes out of that instead of being in out-of-control chaos. And finally, our fifth takeaway is this. Spiritual vitality comes from hearing the Word of God personally. It's one of the most amazing portions in Scripture. A woman hears the words of Jesus, goes and tells others, which is what we're to do yet, right? And they come and they hear, and some are converted and saved. But later, as Jesus is there for two days and teaches, and they follow up on their commitment of believing, they pull her aside and say, we want you to know we appreciate you introducing us to Jesus, but we don't believe just because of what you said. We believe because we have personally heard the Word of God. Now, do you know what a light touch is? Just a light touch. I want to give just a light touch. Pastors, and I was one of them, for many, many years in ministry, I would think about the people who were not there on a Sunday, and I'd be frustrated and depressed about it. And I even talk to my wife and say, what do you suppose they were doing? They could have been here. I took it personally. You know, that'll destroy you. And eventually, I had kind of a breaking experience where that was one of the things that went away when I relaunched in ministry. But there are Sundays when I know, and this church is no different than any other, that if everybody who ordinarily could come or should come, and I'm not talking about vacation days or when you're sick or when you're recovering from surgery, I'm not talking about that, but the times we could be here and we're not, I, I just think uh, the benefits of being here as often as we can, like the Samaritans, now we believe because what we have heard. Now, I recognize, I do, that there are things that happen during the summer months, especially in other times. We have family come in, and I always tell people, uh, hey, if you had family, come bring them to church. Well, I know you can't always do that, but the main point is not about attendance as much as here's how the Samaritans came to believe by hearing the words of Jesus. And it transformed their lives. And I would suggest the same is true for us today. And finally, number five is, are we believers or are we just fans? How wonderful it is to believe in Jesus, to lay hold of Him, to have confidence in Him, and to be committed to Him. It's about this time that I would share with you a final little story. One year I went to Promise Keepers over at in Indianapolis with a group of, I don't know, 70,000 men. It was amazing. And we had some men that were not saved sitting in the seat in front of me. And, uh, of course, you can hear what everybody says. It's in the dark as we're on the way home, late trip. And I heard one of them say to the other, what is it they want us to do? They didn't quite know what it meant to commit and believe in Jesus. 
And though I thought it was pretty plain, they, they didn't get it any more than the woman at the well fully understood. And it's possible today that you could be here and say, I'm a great, I'm a great fan of Jesus, to which I would say, wonderful. But what, what I really mean is are we committed to Jesus in our moral life and all that entails? Or are we believers or just fans? Um, all the things that we read about in just a moment, uh, I mean just a moment ago, but how wonderful it is to believe and know Him personally. Now as the worship team comes back, here's, here's how I would answer those two men in front of me in the seat and how I would present our invitation today. It's that simple. Well, what do you want me to do? Uh, for most of you, you didn't fall asleep while I was preaching today. Thank you for that. You didn't. I saw a few that were fighting it, and I appreciate you fighting the good fight. I do. I do. Um, but the most important message I can share with you is the difference between feeling and believing and committing. And so many of you, yet you shook your head, yes, I am a believer. Not just I believe in Christ, I'm committed to Him. I've surrendered my life to Him. He's forgiven my sins, and now I'm righteous in His sight because of who He is and all those things that are biblical principles. But it's certainly possible that in any size group there could be some folks who would say, by those definitions, Pastor, I'm not sure really I'm as much a believer as I thought I was by the biblical definition. And I want that to change today. And all we're going to do is open up the altar or the front pews. And if you want to come, for any reason, but if you want to come about that, maybe you've, maybe you've heard the gospel X number of times, and today's the day where you say, that all clicks with me. I get that. I see it differently than I have before, maybe. And you say, I want that to change in my life today and experience the grace of God. Now, Heavenly Father, before we sing another song, I pray for our flock today. I'm not their judge. I would never stand up here and point them out one at a time and say, you're a believer, not a fan. You're a fan, not a believer. Your moral life doesn't measure up based on the biblical definition. I'd never do that. You tell us not to do that, matter of fact. But I would ask people to look in their own hearts because we all know right where we are. So as we sing today, Heavenly Father, I pray that that Holy Spirit on this Pentecost Sunday of 2024 would, would come inside of us and flow into us with that life-giving eternal life and then flow out of us. And if we don't have that and our hearts are hungry for it, that we simply come and avail ourselves of the saving power of Jesus. So friends, I leave that with you as we sing our final song. Our altars are open. I'll come back for a final prayer in just a moment. Thank you.